The first underwater nuclear test was carried out by the United States in 1946 at their Pacific Proving Grounds. The operation was called Crossroads and consisted of two separate tests, Abel and Baker, carried out on Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. The climax, of course, was the Baker test, which took place on July 25, 1946. An atomic bomb known as Helen of Bikini with a yield of 23 kilotons was detonated at a depth of 90 feet below the water's surface. The explosion it triggered is still described as both awe-inspiring and terrifying. It was a grim testament to the incredible power of the atomic age. After the explosion, a massive column of radioactively contaminated water formed, reaching an astonishing height of over 1.2 miles. At its base, this column had an incredible width of about 1,800 feet. The explosion stirred waves that reached a staggering height of 100 feet or more near the epicenter. As they moved, however, they lost their energy, so a series of nine waves about 16 feet tall reached the shores of the atoll. Still, even that would have been enough to cause serious damage if anyone lived in the area. Only military ships were nearby, and the waves were tossing them onto the sandy stretches of the island, leaving the vessels brimming with remnants of the ocean floor. These explosions were horrifyingly powerful. Fortunately, underwater nuclear tests were banned by two international treaties in 1963 and 1996. But in reality, it seems like the oceans don't care about nuclear bombs. It's as if the most potent human weapon means nothing to them. Well, we're talking about the consequences, all that radioactive dust, waste. Anyway, I figured out why no one in the ocean dies after an explosion. Yes, I agree, the intro was a bit stretched, but I had to set up the scene somehow. So first coffee and, and let's get started. An unobtrusive reminder to make sure you hit the like button if that's something you do. And now to the main point. It's going to be interesting. So first we need to figure out what the consequences were of the Helen of Bikini explosion. As I already said, it created huge waves and nine of them reached the shores of the atoll. Large masses of water, ships thrown up, filled with sand and seaweed. Near the epicenter of the blast, the waves were bigger. And at a distance of 750 feet was the USS Arkansas a 27,000-ton battleship of the U.S. Navy, which was used as a target for the bomb test. According to eyewitnesses, it was smashed as if by a huge hammer from below. It seems that the massive wave overturned the ship, which was then driven into shallow water by the column of water raised by the explosion. By the way, other ships you see in the explosion site were also used for testing. Some of them were sunk by the explosion, while others were filled with animals, pigs, rats, sheep. They were needed to study how radiation could potentially affect the crew if people were relatively close to the explosion of such a bomb. During the actual tests, there were no people nearby. To set off the bomb in this area, all locals were moved out. They were promised they could come back once the tests were done, but nobody still lives there. In 1972, about 100 residents were voluntarily brought back to their home island. However, scientists later discovered dangerously high levels of strontium-90 in the well water in May 1978, and the residents had unusually high concentrations of cesium-137 in their bodies. It was clear that the radiation levels here were too hazardous, so people were evacuated again in September 1978. Nowadays, the atoll is occasionally visited by divers and some scientists. Plus, there are always different caretakers. Well, tourists also come by, but living here long term is simply not possible. And all of this is because the tests were conducted too close to the shore, at a depth of just 90 feet. If they had detonated the bomb in the open ocean, the consequences would have been completely different. For example, let's take waves. Underwater explosions created some of the biggest waves the planet Earth has ever seen. Waves that happen after a nuclear bomb test are often described as a type of shock wave because they act very differently from regular waves. Unlike standard ocean waves, which are caused by wind and tides, these waves are created by the rapid displacement of water due to the explosion's energy. But there are nuances. For example, the size and type of the explosive charge play a role as well as the presence, composition, and distance of reflecting surfaces, like the ocean floor. Depth, to put it simply. If an explosion happens in shallow water, the shock wave is limited by the water surface in the ocean floor, creating a surface splash and potentially huge waves. Remember, right? The Baker test created a water column over 1.2 miles high because the bomb was detonated at a relatively shallow depth. And it's a whole different story if the explosion occurs under a massive amount of water. 
During a deep water detonation, the blast forms a quickly expanding bubble of hot gases. The bubble creates a shock wave that moves out in all directions, however depth is depth, and ocean pressure can cause this bubble to collapse and rebound, generating oscillating waves. And these waves are usually much less destructive because they don't reach the surface with all their force. Well, and they spread out sideways not as quickly. In short, you get what I mean. So could a truly massive explosion lead to tsunamis? Surprisingly, it can't. Even with the power of nuclear bombs, they don't trigger tsunamis in the conventional sense, because, well, how do tsunamis form anyway? A large volume of water gets displaced over a similarly large area, usually due to an earthquake. Underwater explosions push water out in a relatively small localized area. Even if this area is 1,640 feet in diameter, it's still too small for a tsunami. So even the biggest underwater nuclear tests couldn't cause a tsunami or anything like it. By the way, they had completed nine underwater explosions before they got banned. Besides the Operation Baker, which I've already mentioned, there was also the British Hurricane, American Wigwam, Wahoo, and Umbrella, Swordfish, as well as three Soviet bombs. By the way, Wigwam was the first atomic test in the deep ocean and remains the only one conducted at a depth of more than 984 feet. At this point, you might wonder, why detonate nuclear bombs underwater at all? I mean, it's clear how nuclear weapons emerged. World War II ended, and then came the Atomic Age, and immediately several countries started an arms race. The logic was simple. If you have nuclear weapons, no one will attack you. Except for the one who also has nuclear weapons, so you need to produce as many nuclear weapons as possible. Countries like the USA, the USSR, the UK, France, and China became nuclear powers between 1945 and 1964. During this same period, a large number of nuclear tests were conducted, not just underwater, but underwater tests had their own goals. And the main one was to assess the impact of nuclear weapons on military ships. It was necessary to find out how destructive nuclear bombs could be if they exploded beneath the ocean surface and also under the enemy's fleet. Understanding the consequences of underwater explosions was crucial for naval warfare tactics, but as a bonus, one could study the effects of radiation on marine ecosystems, water, and the atmosphere, and show just how powerful a country is from a military standpoint. But does the ocean and everyone living in it really not care about nuclear bomb explosions? It sounds like total nonsense. We're talking about radiation that kills everything alive. That's true. But radioactive elements act quite differently in water than they do in soil or air. Picture this. A bomb detonates above the ground, radioactive isotopes mix with the soil and debris, get lifted into the air, and are carried by air currents before falling down as radioactive fallout. This fallout pollutes the soil elsewhere, radiation gets into plants and then into animals. In short, we've explained how this works before. Meanwhile, testing nuclear weapons in the ocean will have a negative impact on the local environment, but at the same time, many of the produced elements will dissolve in the water, so many of them will spread out quickly over a large area, so the concentration level will be low. The land won't be affected by these processes at all. Radiation will stay in the ocean. Yes, underwater nuclear explosions are harmful to marine life and do indeed pollute the ocean with radioactive substances, but the oceans are huge, and the water in them is constantly moving. So even if the worst toxins were dumped into the water, over time, they would mix with the clean water and the concentration would drop to safe levels. The ocean can absorb radioactive isotopes. They mix with the water at depth, get diluted more than a hundred times, then are carried further by currents and get diluted even more. The process goes on and on and on. A good example is Chernobyl. A nightmarish disaster, a monstrous release of radiation, contaminated land, dead people. The reactor explosion affected the level of cesium in the Black Sea, which is located over 400 miles from Chernobyl. The levels were 10 to 20 times higher than normal after the 1986 accident, and this seems incredibly dangerous. However, this level of cesium doesn't cause direct harm to marine life or people. You can swim in the Black Sea, eat fish from the Black Sea, and if you want, drink the salty water from there. The idea isn't great, but only because seawater is already undrinkable. Cesium isn't really the issue here. Oh, and here's another important point. Nuclear weapons generally produce isotopes that have short half-lives. They decay into less dangerous atoms much faster compared to the isotopes released into the environment after nuclear power plant accidents. That's why people have been living safely in Hiroshima for decades. But radiation levels around the Chernobyl nuclear plant are still off the charts. 
Also, you should keep in mind that the bombs detonated during Operation Crossroads were plutonium bombs. Plutonium doesn't dissolve well in seawater, meaning it just settles to the ocean floor and stays there. This fact also explains why the concentration of plutonium in our oceans is low. It was measured in the 2000s. They took measurements in various spots in the Pacific Ocean, but the plutonium levels everywhere ended up being about the same and not exceeding the normal range. Well, fish are doing great because they're constantly swimming and can just move away from a more polluted spot if needed. They don't even have to wait for ocean currents to clean it up. The ones really at risk are the sea animals that end up close to the explosion. They're likely to die instantly, but not in the same way they would on land. Surface explosions can burn skin, blow off limbs, and scatter objects and shrapnel through the air. In an underwater explosion, the surrounding water doesn't absorb the pressure like air does, but moves along with it. The explosion transfers pressure with greater intensity over a larger distance, and when it hits any underwater creature, it impacts the air-filled cavities in their body, and then it's instant gas compression, blockage of blood vessels, rupture of internal tissues. Radiation won't be needed. Death will be swift and unpleasant regardless. But otherwise, after the nuclear tests, nature is thriving. In 2017, a group of scientists discovered with amazement an abundance of marine life in the Bikini Atoll crater, the very same one that, after the tests, was declared a radioactive wasteland where people can't live. But nobody told the fish and other sea creatures about it. Actually, the impact of radiation poisoning on ocean life has never been studied in detail, but apparently ocean creatures turned out to be surprisingly resilient. Just compare them to the animals studied around the Chernobyl nuclear power plant explosion. There were deformations and mutations observed, but marine life at Bikini Atoll didn't face anything like that. Well, almost. The research team discovered a diverse ecosystem inside and around the bomb crater, including corals the size of a car, hundreds of fish schools including tuna, sharks, and snappers, as well as coconut crabs munching on radioactive coconuts on the shore. To the naked eye, crabs, fish, and corals of Bikini Atoll look completely normal and healthy, and some corals have been living for several decades. This means there's evidence they might have started growing just 10 years after the last bombs were detonated. With news that in other areas coral reefs are being ruined by ordinary pollution, the situation on the atoll seems especially awesome and odd. But there's an even stranger fact. On January 17, 1966, around 10.30 in the morning, the Spanish could see something fall from the sky, and it fell right into the water. For the next few weeks, newspapers around the world reported rumors of a terrible disaster. Two American military planes collided in midair during refueling and dropped four B-28 thermonuclear bombs on the city of Palomares. The fuses in two of these bombs exploded on impact, spreading radioactive materials like deadly plutonium-239 across a wide rural area. Luckily, the safety systems and electronics stopped the nuclear explosions, and the bombs were found quickly. The third one landed in the stream with a parachute, was relatively unharmed, and was retrieved. But the last bomb just disappeared. It got lost somewhere at the bottom. To lose a thermonuclear bomb? Just think about the absurdity and horror of this situation. The hunt for the bomb began, and to put it in perspective, this was a warhead with 1.1 megatons of explosive power, equivalent to 1,100,000 tons of TNT. It took the U.S. Navy search teams three months to find it. They used a state-of-the-art submarine and a little-known 18th century theorem. It helps people use information about past events to calculate the probability of them happening again. This way, they figured out where exactly to look for the bomb, and then, using the submarine, finally found it. But it still needed to be lifted from a depth of 2,850 feet. To do this, they rigged up something like a giant fishing line with a giant hook to pull the bomb to the surface, where divers could then grab it and secure it safely. But the bomb had a parachute, which suddenly started doing what it does best, slowing down its cargo and making it hard to move. The fishing line broke, and the bomb fell, ending up even deeper than before. Only later, with the help of a new robotic submarine, was the bomb finally lifted by the parachute and disarmed. But the Palomares incident isn't the only time nuclear weapons have gone missing. Usually, they were found, but it's definitely known that three American bombs were lost forever. They're still out there, somewhere, hiding in swamps, fields, and oceans all over the planet. Actually, we know a lot about American lost bombs just because these cases get more attention. 
there must be other examples from other countries, the UK, France, Russia, and China. But we're interested in the bomb that ended up in the ocean. It's a thermonuclear bomb that fell into the Philippine Sea on December 5, 1965. Back then, the bomber, the pilot, and the nuclear weapon slipped off the carrier aircraft and nobody ever saw them again. They just disappeared. They sank. The good news is that this bomb, like all the missing ones, is unlikely to cause a nuclear explosion. Bad news, it's unlikely we'll be able to find it. Usually, bombs can be found through visual search, and that's extremely difficult. To start with, you need to determine which area the bomb is actually in, and then search the ocean in parts. It's a damn exhausting and inefficient process that requires divers or submarines. An alternative would be to look for radiation spikes, but nuclear bombs aren't actually all that radioactive. They're literally designed not to pose a radioactive threat to the people who handle them. So even if a nuclear bomb is at the bottom of the ocean, according to experts, it doesn't pose a threat to the ocean. They don't emit radiation and aren't at risk of exploding. They just lie there. And the ocean doesn't really care about all this. Nuclear Turtles When people were busy bombarding Earth with atomic bombs in the second half of the 20th century, turtles all around the world were quietly and very slowly living their lives. Neither the turtles nor the people knew that the legacy of these terrible explosions was deeply imprinted on their shells. However, scientists in a recent study examined the shells of turtles found near atomic bomb test sites and nuclear waste dumps. In the layers of keratin, they unexpectedly discovered clear traces of anthropogenic uranium from radioactive fallout. Turtle shells grow in layers, similar to tree rings. And just like tree rings, they can preserve information about what was happening around them. Deep Sea Radiation However, the consequences of nuclear tests from that time can be seen not only in the shells of turtles living near the blast sites. Not long ago, scientists found unstable carbon isotopes in the bodies of shrimp-like creatures living in the Mariana Trench. Researchers studied these isotopes and found out that they come from nuclear warheads that were tested during the Cold War. In other words, nuclear warhead explosions over the Pacific Ocean left their mark in the guts of tiny crustaceans at depths of up to 36,000 feet. This means the isotope drifted on the ocean surface, then ended up in the organisms of the creatures living there, and from there into the food chain, eventually sinking to the very bottom. It's interesting that the level of radioactive carbon in these deep sea shrimp also points to their long lifespan, over 10 years. Compared to shallow water shrimp, that's really long, but it probably isn't related to radiation. Unexpected find The odds of accidentally finding a nuclear weapon while fishing are low, but never zero. At least for a man who was diving off the coast of British Columbia, hunting for sea cucumbers, he stumbled upon a strange object the size of a double bed. At first, the man thought he had found a UFO, but then he managed to figure out that in 1950, a Convair 36B bomber had crashed near British Columbia. The plane was testing how well it could carry an atomic bomb. It turned out not very well. This lost bomb is what the man found, although it's likely that it doesn't contain radioactive materials because the early tests were conducted with a dummy capsule. Well, probably to avoid accidentally losing valuable weaponry. You owe me a like. See you later.